Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Good Stuff. I'm Kevin Billy, and as always, we appreciate you joining us. Well, I'm biased, but maybe my favorite time of the year, I would, I would maybe go to April, March Madness, Masters, all that. But man, when when, when the sneakers start going and, and hoop starts going, uh, it revs me up. And uh, I'm honored today to have Jamie and Christian with us. And Jamie is the head men's basketball coach at George Washington University. Coach, what's going on, man? It's great to be on, man. Thanks. It's a great time of year, like you said before, and I'm excited to chat with you a little bit today. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to it as well. I, I know uh, you, you got practices going. You got some probably a scrimmage or secret scrimmage here or there, and then the games are starting here soon. But, you know, I'd be interested right off the bat to find out um, when did you know you wanted to be a coach? Is this just something that you've always wanted to do? Uh, you know, I, you know, people always ask me that question and, and to answer it, you know, I'm the oldest of about six or seven cousins down in New Kent, Virginia, where I grew up and my grandmother would watch everybody, you know, every, every all our parents would go to work and uh, all the grandkids would come over and I was the oldest. So, you know, because of that, I had to basically teach everyone how to play every game there was, you know, if we're going to play basketball, I had to teach everyone how to play basketball or baseball, or football. You know, so in some ways, I've always kind of been teaching or coaching in some regards since I was pretty young. You know, my dad's a my dad's a high school coach. He coaches he coached football for a, for a long period of time. He's a track and field guy, so he coached track and has a couple state a couple state championships in that. My mom's also a teacher. She's educated for thirty five plus years special education. Um, so I would say we've had such an educational background mm -hmm. that I would say that number one, I, I didn't always know I was going to be a coach. Um, I thought I would go back into education in some regard because I am passionate about educating our youth in a lot of different ways. And, and that's why a lot of the stuff that we do here might be a little bit different, but it's based off education, not necessarily off the scoreboard every single day. And, um, you know, I think when I got into college, you know, all of us go, I was Virginia State Player of the Year. I loved playing. I, I, like, I love competing. You know, we're, we're going to probably play full court one on one today. Um, and I love doing that. And, and I don't know if I'll ever let that passion diminish with how much I love playing. Um, but my high school coach um, asked me to coach a summer league team one time, mm -hmm. um, right when I was like a junior, senior in college. And I just loved doing it. I loved watching the guys perform. I love watching the players get better. I love building out the practice plan. And so at that point, I started kind of getting a little inkling that like I might want to coach, but it really wasn't until I was probably you know, into my senior year that I felt like that was a really, really great place for me. Gotcha. Well, a lot in there to unpack. One yeah. person you didn't mention too, your brother's a coach. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to know just like, how nice is it? You mentioned your mom and dad, so that, that you know, I guess you could put them in there as well. And we're going to get to some of these uh, coaches you've had in your life, but how nice is it to have a brother of coaches? I got to think, you know, I can't imagine what that's like on vacation or you guys got to be sounding boards to one another. <laughs> that's, that's a nice lifeline to have. It's the best, you yeah, know, yeah. it's the best. And, you know, we now joke that it's the family business, although it's only two of us that are coaching basketball, but um, you know, it's been great watching him, you know, obviously when you have a younger brother, you know, there's a, you know, you always love your younger brother. You always make fun of them. You know, we have that same relationship that many of you all do, but in the same respect, you love watching him grow. And I've had a chance mm -hmm. to watch him grow as a, as a player. I coached him at for a year at Emory and Henry and then watched him grow as a coach. And, you know, he coached division, division two for a bit, division three, and you know, he's really worked his way up. And so really proud of him and his development about what he's been able to do and what he's been able to accomplish so far. And I think he's got a lot of stuff ahead of him. And you talk about these family vacations, you know, you know, when he started coaching and really getting deeply into it, that's when our family vacation took another level. That's when it was like, Oh, when are we going to all go? Because, you know, before then, you know, I, you know, before then it was like me kind of being the big brother and sharing wisdom. And now it's much more of just a conversation about practices and what we want to do. And our wives take the kids and kind of go off and do yeah. what they to do. But um, I really enjoy our time together now and just being able to have, like you said, that sounding board, um, but someone that can tell you, hey, you're wrong. And someone that can tell mm -hmm. you that you're right. You know, I mean, I enjoy that relationship that I have with them. That's great. Yeah. A lot of X and O in the sand on the beach. I bet. <laughs> hey, let's go back to those coaches you just mentioned. I know you've had a number of impressive ones. I'll let you talk about that a little bit. Obviously, Jim Phelan from an outside perspective comes to mind, uh, you know, some family. What type of impact did he and these others have on you and are still having on you as a coach now in your life? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, I think when someone calls you a coach, it, to me, it means someone that's impacted your life. And I'm really fortunate to have so many people that have taken that time to do that. Um, you know, my high school coach at Allen Juniors in the Virginia State High School Hall of Fame, he's an unbelievable head coach there, and, you know, won a ton of games in a lot of different decades. So I had a chance to learn from him 
but, you know, again, when I was just kind of coming through high school. And so my, my understanding of coaching and leadership really started um, from the coaching standpoint, working with him, you know, and then from there, I went on to play for coach Jim Phelan at Mount St. Mary's 840 victories. Um, just one of the best, best men in the game and, you know, coached for 49 years and, um, you know, the way that he was able to interact with us as players, even though he was a little bit older, I always thought it was really special. And you could tell that he loved the connection he had with the guys, the connection he was able to share with them. You know, I had a chance to be impacted by him twice because he not only coached me, but then when I came back to coach them out, right. he would spend, you know, he would come in once a week and we'd go to lunch and we would talk basketball. And he really, you know, I really was fortunate because I felt like I got the best of him in both ways. You know, a guy who stepped away from the game a little bit, but still very connected and able to share. And then from there, Milan Brown took over my senior year. He's an associate head coach at Pitt right now and a tremendous coach. He's one of the youngest coaches in the game at the time. So I got a chance to watch him as a player and how he was able to use his youth to be able to connect with us. Um, Milan did an outstanding job at both Mount St. Mary's and then at Holy Cross. Um, and then Bob Johnson, I worked for at Emory and Henry Division Three. The ODAC Coach of the Year Award is named after him. Coach Johnson was an Army Ranger, so his mm -hmm. view of leadership was different. You know, it was more it was more demanding, it, and uh, it was amazing to be a part of that. You know, I think you know choosing to go there was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life because, you know, he was an outstanding basketball coach but an outstanding leader, you know, and it's hard to find both of those, you know, usually you find one or the other, but his knowledge of the game was so in depth and he demanded that as a young coach, you learned all these different ways, you know? So if you can imagine going into a coach's office at 22 years old and, and him wanting you to learn the swing offense, the Princeton offense, right. and you have to basically come in and teach him. And he already knows all these things. Yeah. And he would basically red stamp the things that were good. And he would cross out the things that weren't, and he employed you to learn how to teach. And so from Bob Johnson to Pat Flannery at Bucknell, who had all that success in the, in the mid two thousands, um, you know, going to the NCAA tournament, winning back-to-back -back first round games at Bucknell plays that and hadn't done that up to that point. Um, an outstanding leader in person within my life. From there, uh, Tony Shaver, William and Mary, who was legendary in two circles now, Hampton, Sydney, and William and Mary, what he's been able to do there, and what he was able to do in building that. Shaka Smart, everybody loves Coach Smart because he's the best and they should all love him. You know, outstanding job at both VCU and all of VCU, Texas, and he's going to do a great job at Marquette. It fits him so well. And, um, you know, and it was great to watch him, you know, a little bit later in my career, you know, to be with a, with a young black head coach and watch how he was able to lead and how he was able to connect. You know, and because that's the things that you don't always, you know, you, that takes a little while to learn. Um, he was just outstanding. And then and then I had my opportunity right after that to go to Mount St. Mary's and sort of started my, my journey. And, and I've tried to take the same kind of interest in trying to help others come along as others are taking into me. Yeah, I love it. I, I think it's it's just unique to hear about that stuff from coaches, you know, in that tree, if you will. But then all those coaches, I'm sure it's like if you if you if you took the Jamie and Christian piece of pie, you know, they all they all got a little piece there and, and have helped develop you. And of course, you you've had your own philosophies. And uh, you know, as you were think as you were talking there, I'm like, man, it's it's you, it's Chambers, Kyle Getter. We've got some VCU guys on here. We haven't had Coach Smart yet, but maybe maybe we can get them now. Um, it's, it's let, let's go back to what you said. I'll tell, I'll tell you this though, it's a, it's a lot of us. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a lot of us from that VCU tree. I mean, mm -hmm. it's going to be really hard pressed to not find someone that's kind of touched that circle because, you know, and just a little bit of the history of it before that we had Jeff Capel at VCU. And so you have the Jeff Capel guys and then you have the Anthony Grant guys, yeah, right. the Shaka guys. And then, you know, obviously Will came back. So you have a lot of connecting parts throughout college basketball that I think we'll have, you know, Shaka's going to probably have one of the largest trees here, uh, you know, if he doesn't already. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So, you know, talking about that piece of pie, but then going back to something you said earlier uh, that, that caught my attention, uh, and I don't know if this is philosophically for you or whatnot, but you said a lot of what we do here is based on education. Tell me a little bit about that, because that's just not something you hear every day talking to a college basketball coach. Yeah, you know, one of the first slides we show our guys when they get here is this is a learning environment. And and we talk a lot of, a lot about learning. And even when we're talking about bringing players in, it's all about their the capacity to reach their full capacity. And when I say that, I mean, you know, everyone has, you know, everyone has a, like, everyone looks and says, oh, this guy has so much potential. Right. But at the end of the day, your potential doesn't matter unless you have the capacity to reach it, you know, and then yeah. are you doing these certain things on a day to day basis to reach your full, full capacity? Like, are you, you know, on, when things are really difficult, are you doubling down and working really hard at it to try to learn it and try to figure it out? Right. Um, you know, if, if you're struggling in an area, are you asking for help? Are you listening for help? Are you asking people that may know a little bit more? Like these are all the kind of things that we're really looking for when we're talking about recruiting 
because I think, you know, the diff- the talent gap is so small, but the learning gap is so large. Mm-hmm. And so if we can try to close that learning gap and find those who are really, who really enjoy learning, we're going to be in a great position. You know, the other thing is when you talk about being in a learning environment, you know, what we're trying to do here, we're trying to do something that's never been done before. Like, I believe this is one of the best jobs in college basketball. And I think not everybody recognizes it right now. And, and my job is to make sure the world knows when we're all done here. And, and I'm excited about that challenge. But to be able to do that, it is about about being able to learn, you know, learning from the mistakes of people that came before us, learning from the mistakes of, of, of people um, or learning from the successes that people have had as well. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really important to understand. Like, you know, when you really think about it, you know, obviously I'm like really passionate about learning and education. Like you, know, you really think about this, you know, we all rode a bike when we were young and the first time we got on that bike, we usually fell off. Right. And, yeah. and then we had to get up and we had to learn how to do it again. But everything in our lives, the first time we do that, are not everything, but most things in our lives, the first time we try them out, we are going to fail. We're going to fall. And then it's about, do you have people around you that can support you, pick you back up, or you have to pick yourself back up and kind of learn from the experience that you had before. And so I think really identifying as a learning environment, I think is a really key essential part of what we do here. Um, you know, You know, one thing about when you're in a learning environment, there's an understanding that you are going to fail. There's also an understanding that you are going to be supported when you fail. And there's also an understanding that, that we're going to learn from all those failures. And I do think that's really important. Um, you know, everybody wants to do well. Everybody wants to go four for four in the World Series and yeah, right. win the game and or make the free throw at the end to, to win the basketball game, right? Um, so it's not really about the successes as much as it is helping people understand how to handle the failures. And I think being in a learning environment allows you the ability and the capacity to learn from it, to grow from it, to improve. And I think, you know, what I've found out is when we've been able to do that and create a really strong learning environment, we've been able to really achieve greatness because your, your, your ability to learn is directly connected to your ability to be great at something. Um, and so by making it not about your talent, but about your ability to learn, it's just been, you know, I, I, that's one of the reasons I feel so strongly about the place where I am now. Yeah, that's good, man. That's that's really good. Well, how, how do you create that learning environment? Is that a philosophical thing? Like if, if I'm a, a coach or a business owner listening to this, you know, and, and I'm drinking from the Kool-Aid right now, give me some tangible ways to to make that happen within my business or my program. Yeah, the first thing we did this year, we brought our guys back in May. We spent two, re- two weeks and we didn't do any basketball. Um, we only talked about, like, I have a leadership enhancement workbook that we work through with our players that I think is really important. It's taken me about 10 years to put together. And and so we've put it together and, you know, like the first thing you're going to talk about is like how you act, how you interact with one another. Right. And, and really hammering those things down and hammering down what that looks like. You know, I mean, we obviously we're value, you probably can tell we're very values based program. So I want our players to understand our values. But before they can really understand our values, I want them to really understand, like, what is what does success look like? What is how I treat people look like good and bad? How do I address people when we have a disagreement? You know, really trying to hammer those things down in the first couple of weeks and then holding people accountable to their reactions. Right. And so, again, we went no basketball. Everyone thinks, oh, man, we got it. We finally got everybody back. We should be on the floor flying around. I said, no, we're not going to do that at all. We're going to spend two straight weeks. We're going to talk about our culture and our leadership and how we need to interact um, and make that a point of emphasis. And, and, you know, I think it got us off to a great start culturally because what's important to realize is like every situation someone's coming from has a different set of standards. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I want them to come in here and I want them to bring everything they've learned from other places. Right. Cause that makes us stronger. Like us being able to learn from, from where some of these guys came from makes us stronger, but then also being able to say like, this is what we stand for. And this is how we're going to get there. And then holding people accountable to that, I think is essential to any organization. I think sometimes it's easy to start with the stuff that we love doing, um, you know, and, and that might be getting on the floor right away. But for me, it's like, man, let's really lock in here and make sure we're treating each other the right way. We're having the right kind of responses and we're building out the, our, our team chemistry from day one. And, um, you know, we just spent a lot of time on it. Kudos to you, coach. That's good stuff, man. That, that's really, really good. I, going back to that failure, too, I'd like you to touch on just for a second, like, how has failure shaped you over time? Yeah, I mean, man, we're all shaped by our failures. And, right. and some of the failures are public and some of these failures are not public, right? And, right. Um, you know, I remember, you know, just the, the kind of places I start, I remember when I was like nine years old and I'm play, playing Little League for the first time and and I'm getting a chance to pitch, you know, and you know, and again, I'm fortunate. I have this background with my mom and dad, 
that's like really like essential to who I am as a person. Um, and I remember, you know, I, I remember I'm up there and I walk the bases loaded in the first opportunity and, and the bases are loaded. And I, I'm throw, I think I threw like, like all balls, like 12 straight balls or something crazy. And, you know, or nine straight balls, or, yeah, 12 straight balls, walk the bases loaded. And, and uh, I remember being on the mound and looking over at my parents, my dad just kind of gave me like the relax look, you know? Um, and like in that moment, I mean, that's a ton of failure when you're nine, like you feel like everything, you know, you've always wanted yeah. to pitch. It's your first time out there on the mound. And, and he kind of just gave me that look and I calmed down and I end up striking out the next three and getting into the next thing. And, and so there's like a level of failure in all the walks that I was able to do. And then also having that level of resolve for my father and that look to go out and continue and push forward. Right. And so, you know, those are like little small things that, that I would say like that was failure turned into success. And that gave me that feeling right there in that moment. And then, you know, the difference is like, you know, my you talking about my father and, and my mom, like, because everything is about learning, then when you come home, the conversation wasn't about the success that we had on the field. Like we didn't talk about the strikeouts. We didn't talk about the walks really. It was like, well, what do you think you need to do to be better? And my dad was like, well, why don't you practice more? And I said, well, how do you practice more? You know, and he would just show me how to practice. And he wouldn't out there with me every second of the day, but he would kind of give me a little, a little, a little nugget to say, Hey, hey this is how you can practice more. And then, and then he would let me take that as far as I wanted to take it, you know? And um, you know, my parents were definitely not like, you know, they're not like some of the parents now that are like trying to pave the way for their, for their, for their players, for their, for their kids. But they definitely gave me the platform, the environment where I could go and be at my very best, you know, yeah, um, for sure. you know I would look at be it as a coach, you know, talking about failure. Um, and I think one thing you'll hear me talk about in our program, we always talk about adversity to prosperity, you know, anything that's, that's ever happened great in this world has started from a level of adversity. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that that adversity is presenting you with a challenge that's going to make you better if you choose to look at it that way. And, and so that's why when you say like failures, it's like, you know, like when I fail, I kind of get, I get really juiced, you know, and, you know, we haven't had the best two seasons here at GW so far, but we've learned so much about the A-10. We've learned so much about what we're able to do. And I'm excited about the future here because I feel like we've just taken this learning to an incredible level the last two years. And some of the stuff that we found out about ourselves, man, if I'm playing us this year, I'm going to be scared because I just think that we've had to go to a level in terms of just, it, it, we had to, we've had to go to a level in terms of our program that made us really question where we are and where we need to go to and answer some really tough questions. And we've answered them. We built a plan to attack them. And, and I love where we stand today. That's good. That's good. Hey, I know we were talking a little bit before we jumped on here. Um, you know, you were a head coach at 29 years old. Yeah, you know, I, I was a head coach at 25 years old. I thought I knew everything and knew nothing, coach. It's probably <laughs> still the case. I want to this. This might be another phone call that could be like a three hour phone call. But I want to know, like, what that was like for you. Yeah. I want to I want to hear this. And I, I want to have you ever gone back then, you know, because I have and, and done a deep dive on that. And what I mean by that really is getting that title that lasts for about two seconds, but just getting that alone, that that's early success in life. And there's a lot of things that go along with that. But I think on the flip side too, that can hurt you as an individual, as I know it did at least me at times. So just talk to me a little bit about that experience, especially now where you're at today. Well, it's, it's interesting because my awareness of being a head coach at 29, like that wasn't a goal for me, right? Like I, I, I don't want to say I don't have goals, but I'm very much about like being locked into a process and I've kind of lived my life that way. And I do think my parents helped shape that life for me because mm -hmm. my, you know, my dad's success is a track for all American and all those things. Like they really locked you in on process over, over result and, and trying to be at your best in that moment. And so it, it was interesting when I, when I got the job at Mount St. Mary's, I was with a good friend, Mike Morell, and, you know, and, and they offered me the job and I hadn't decided if I was going to take it or not. And, and Mike Morell said, well, you know, you'll be a head coach at 29. You'll be a head coach before 30. That's a benchmark in our business. And I had no idea that it was a benchmark in our business yeah. because I hadn't really, I hadn't really, hadn't, hadn't really dawned on me what it really meant, you know? Um, and, you know, I think by trying to always be like a truly humble leader and always trying to like recognize that, you know, this thing can be taken away from us in a moment's notice. You know, I was at Bucknell, with Coach Pat Flannery, they had two of the most amazing years, three three of the most amazing years ever. And in year four, you know, we struggled because we had a lot of young guys who ended up going to the NCAA tournament when they were juniors or seniors. Um, so they were talented players, but they were just younger. 
And, you know, basically, you know, he retires and steps away from the game. And so it's like, you feel like, man, we're about to take this, this jump here at Bucknell and you come mm-hmm. in the office one day and a decision has been made and, and now you're trying to find another job. Right. And I think all of us in this business sort of go through that at some point, that's just part of it. So I've always just tried to keep that as like my mindset in this, you know, like I got to really enjoy today um, and just appreciate what I get a chance to do and the opportunity that we have, because, you know, a decision can be made at any moment. And that could really affect us. So, you know, when I talk about being a head coach at 29, you know, I recognize that as a bench, benchmark for many people. Um, I think it's I, I think it's more impressive. I've been a head coach for 10 years at yeah. 39, you know, true, I, like, true. you know, because at 29, like you said, I didn't know everything. But, you know, they hire you because you have the ability to figure it all out. And, you know, I've, I'm really happy that we've been able to figure it out at three different places so far. Um, and, I, and I think that's the real challenge is that you know, your age is an advantage when you're at 29. Um, but being a head coach at 29 allows you to, if you're a head coach at 39, that's like really good because you've got so much experience and you've got so many mistakes behind you that you have an opportunity to learn from. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's good. Um, that's, that's good. I, I know there's, there's a lot in there to unpack, uh, you know, and, and, and we could probably talk about that one for a long time. Like I said, well, um, you know, George Washington, I mean, I, you know, honestly, and rest in peace, I, I think I'm taking you back here, but I think Incadare, man, growing up, that was the guy, right? And, um, but what what's it like for you? I mean, can you even put into words, you know, growing up where you did and being where you're at? You alluded to earlier what type of job that is, but what's it like for you coaching there at George Washington? Well, you know, everybody gets everybody gets a head coaching job and at their press conference, hey, this is my dream job, you know, like I, I always joke with my friends because like they'll have a job at some random place and they'll be like, oh, this is my dream job. And it's like, this was not like that would be your dream opportunity, but that was not your dream job. But for me, it is quite different. You know, I grew up, the Ojin Kadari teams, like I grew up watching Mike Jarvis play on TV and, you know, they had home team sports as a network here. And, you know, when you're two hours south of, of, of Washington, D.C., D.C. is your market. You know, that's what you're watching and that's where you're going for your tournament. And that's where you're going for, for history. And so it's a big deal to be the head coach of George Washington. So this is a place that I would say I've always had circled as a place I thought really fit my values, really fit what I wanted, where, where we wanted mm-hmm. to go. And I'm excited about the partnering of that. And, you know, I recognize that the first two years have been really challenging, but I also recognize that, man, that's, that's the perfect kind of battle for me and the perfect yeah. kind of battle for the staff that we have. And, you know, sometimes, but, you know, I think what happens when you get a dream opportunity um, you have to realize you have to fight for your dream when you're within your dream. And I think a lot of times people receive their dream opportunity and they almost check it off. as like, I made it there. And, uh-huh. and my, my thought has always been, man, I'm fighting for this every single day. You know, the dream was to, to have the opportunity to be here, but the larger dream is what we can do with this canvas that we have here at George Washington university in Washington, DC. And, and so we're fighting for that every single day. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost like that. Uh, you don't want to lose it. Right. I mean, you, you, you want to, you want to keep hold of it. What, what are some key things you'd suggest? Um, I, I would say to anyone going into a team or a company that struggled before, you know, hey, th- this place is struggling. They've hired me to fix it. You know, what are some things that you would say need to be at the forefront of that? Well, man, that's a great question. You know, I'm really big on the assessment of it all. Uh, the assessment of the entire organization, and when we first come into a place, you know, it's been interesting that we've had a lot of success in the first year or first two years, a lot of places we've been, because we've really taken an approach that is almost business-like. So we're coming in and like, like I'm, I'm not making any major decisions in the first hundred days or so. Like we're sitting down, we're assessing every person in the organization. Like I'm going to meet with every player, every athletic trainer, every strength coach, every person that touches any one of our players then I'm going to ask them about every one of the people that are in the organization um, because I want to get a great feel for the emotion in the building. I want a great feel for how people feel about one another. You know, are people capable of doing what we ask them to do? Um, I don't make any rank statements when I first get into the building. Hey, we're going to do this or whatever. Um, we put together a practice plan where we're watching how the guys are improving and what they're doing. Like we're not making a decision on our style of play. When we first walk in the door, um, we're assessing their skill. We're assessing their talent. We're assessing their shooting ability and we're assessing how they are as teammates. And we're going to sit back and we're going to really watch for a long period of time to see where they are. I think one of the things that happens a lot in organizations, you walk in the door and you say, Oh, we've got to change everything. Yeah. But the reality of it is, is if sometimes if you move one chess piece to the left, it changes how everything in the entire program operates. Um, so I think it's, I think in being fair to the people that are there, 
you want to assess where they are and also where they can go within your system, which is going to be different than the last system. And then it's a great opportunity when you come in the door to listen to what's been working, but then also listen to what has not been working. And, um, you know, there's no judgments. Like when I come in, it's no judgments on the person before me. Um, everyone is doing what they can with what they have. And, you know, what you have is also, you know, the stuff you learn along the way is also the resource that you have, you know, and so I just try to do the best I can with what I have. And, and so we're just trying to learn from, from the past and all that. So, you know, we come in, that's like kind of my assessment. Like it's a big time assessment of everything. Um, you know, it's almost like being a consultant within your own program to watch and, and to listen. I think the listening is important. I think a lot of times you come in, People want to make these large statements and, you know, you have to do some of that for your season ticket holders for the next year. Like you, there is some selling to that, but to the group of people you're going to be leading, you know, they just, most of the time, they just want to feel like they're going to be heard. They yeah, want to feel right. like they're going to be led. And I think you have an opportunity to show them the difference in that. Um, and there's a level of fear that probably goes into that. Anytime you bring consultants into any kind of business, um, I think there's a level of fear in that, but I've been amazed, you know, at, at all my stops, We've had players that were averaging three, four points a game that would average 16, 16, 17 with us and had an amazing year. And, um, and it was just because our system was different. It wasn't because the last coaches before didn't know how to use them. It was just based on the system and our system has, you know, values these things. And I think really identifying what in your system you value, you know, and then evaluating the people off of that. I do think that's really important because I think moving someone over that has the morale and the spirit of the team can matter. And I think it gives you, it gives you a simple win inside the locker room. Yeah, I, I think from from what I'm hearing with you too, I, I think two things come to mind when you come in and do something like that in your first 100 days. I think number one, you're not you're not overreacting. You know, you're not really a roller coaster there. You're you're trying to be consistent every day as the leader, and I think people are going to pick up on that. Um, and and I think the second thing is I got to think that's building a lot of trust, coach. And and I think if you've got trust, you know that that's a key part. I mean, I, I would. I would go into there. I, I want to go into this next, uh, you know, talking about, I've heard you say love is accountability and accountability is love. So we're, we're not going to forget that. And I think that's a big part of it too. But going back to what you said with the assessments, where do you stand on the assessment being yours, your staff, whoever that might be, or using some things that are out there? Like, are, are you a guy that uses like, whether it be disc of strength finders or five voices, are, are those things, do, do they get you to where you need to get quicker or are you truly wanting to invest in that assessment purely from your standpoint? Yeah, we do a little bit of all of it. Um, okay. We bring in, um, you know, we bring in uh, risers from a group that we use. They do a tap test, trial on the aptitude performance test. Um, we use them. I've used them for probably, man, a lot of years now. So I have a really real familiarity with that. We've used strength finders as well. Um, I think it's assessment. I think I like bringing in stuff on the outside, but I also think something to always remember is that people respond differently under stress. And that could be a really stressful situation coming into a room with someone that you don't know who controls a bit of your future. Um, and so some of the things you may see on those tests may give you a good, good leg up, um, you know, with other things you need to kind of feel it for yourself. And that's why I think kind of asking everyone questions and doing a couple of rounds of that, yeah. um, you know, so like, it's not just one round of questioning. I usually do about three rounds of questioning. Um, to really try to identify some areas that we can improve on. And then, like I said, like, let's say I'm talking to my academic person and she's given me some areas with someone on their, someone they've had trouble with. Well, when I meet with them, I'm going to say, well, we need you to do these three things. And then the next round of questioning, I'm going to see how far they've come along in those, in those, in those questions, right? That's telling you, I mean, the test might tell you that as well, but that's telling you that their level of buy-in is at a certain right. level. Right. I asked you to do these things like you're talking about building trust Well, building trust goes both directions. Right. Yep. So, hey, there's an acknowledgement. Hey, I asked you to do these things. You did a great job of that. Tremendous. I think I can keep challenging you in more and more areas. So I think the questioning I mean, assessments is really just questioning without saying going high or low. And I do think what's tough is that when you usually when you get an opportunity, you need to stabilize the opportunity. And first, people try to push it to the moon first. And I'm like, no, you need to stabilize first stabilize, control what you can control and see what you have around you um, and just gain, gain question and assess those things. And then you can start climbing every single day. You know, sometimes it's just about getting the boat, the, the boat to port, you know, and yeah. it's not about racing. You just got to get it there. If you get the boat there, now we can restock when we get to shore and be able to do all the things that we need to do. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, I get that. Hey, let's go back to that, that, that love and accountability. When I ask you what makes a great leader, is those the first things that come to mind for you? 
Well, I think everybody leads differently. You know, for me, love mm-hmm. is the way that I love to lead. Um, and I do love to have a lead, lead through accountability, through love yeah. and through appreciation. It doesn't mean that it's not, I'm not hard on you. Like when I talk about love, like, you know, it, it's love like a mother and father's love now. So it can be the moments where I'm on you. There's some moments where I'm when, I, when I'm leaving you alone. Right. So I think it's just important to how you frame it. But I think there's a lot of ways that you can lead, you know, you can lead with fear, you can lead, you know, with just, you know, with, with, you can mislead people and lead as well. Like there's a lot of ways to do it. I think as a leader, you want to identify what's best for you. You know, at the end of the day, you want to look yourself in the mirror and anything that happens that goes well, anything that happens poorly, you want to be able to say, I did the best that I can. And for me, you know, talking about love, loving, leading with love and accountability, it means that when you mess up, you're knowing it's coming from a place where I care about you. You know, we're spending so much time um, with our individual players, not on basketball. Like, I think one of the things that people will be shocked with with me is, you know, when I'm talking to them, it's rarely about basketball. That's our commonality. That's what, you know, we love to do. And I'm going to coach you hard when we get on this floor here and I'm going to share film with you and all that stuff. But really, it's about knowing that that person that's sitting across that desk really cares about you and wants your well-being. And I feel like for me, that's the way that I can lead the best. You know, when yeah. it's not just a transactional, did you make the free throw? Did you miss it? You know, it's much more like, man, are we making your life better? Um, are we teaching the things you need to teach you? I can look myself in the mirror as a leader and say, man, we're doing everything we can to help you, to help support you, to help you get to where you want to get to. And um, but I do think it's important to know what's best for you. And I think people out there need to need to evaluate that. You know, you can't copycat someone's leadership skill. You have to find what works best for you. And for me, it starts with love and ends with love. Yeah, man, I echo that. I I love what you're saying there. And I think that's so important, especially for young people to hear, because they're trying to do so many things to maybe get into the game, stay in the game, move up and get that position. And it's like they're trying to do this drill. They're trying to do this philosophy and and they're trying to morph it all into something that maybe they just don't really have complete conviction in, you know, and it's I I remember I remember just, you know, my my last couple of years finally coaching. I mean, we're pressing the whole game and, and we're fast paced and we're. And man, it, it was just so, it, it, it fit me, you know, it, it really fit me. And, and I think you're, there's just a level of peace that you can get at, I think, as a coach, you know, when you get yourself into that skin. So, yeah, I love what you're saying. What, what are some ways, um, great point, too, about all the different different ways to lead, but what are, what are some ways that, regardless of how you're leading, and maybe you can just dive into to what you're doing there, but how do you build this into your culture every single day so that it sustains? Well, I think it's got to be something that's important to a leader, you know, like what players are always looking for to see, like, what are you just doing to, to check the box and what are you doing that's really meaningful to you? Right. And so, you know, for me, like we have our values on the wall and, and so a lot of times if someone gets in trouble, it's a values violation, right? Like you weren't honest. Right. And so that's the worst thing you can do is have a values violation, you know, and, you know, even in practice, Hey, who was supposed to be on the red line was my, it was his fault. Well, no, like the, you're not being honest. Like this is your responsibility. So I think really for me, it's about sticking to my values every day and everything that we're going to do. And that has to work through everything. And I think everyone else responds to that, you know, and, you know, so it can't be something where you just kind of go over in the first team meeting. And then the first day of practice, you're not following through with that. Um, I, you know, I think you do have to keep referencing your values. You have to keep referencing what you believe and why you believe them and you know it's not one of these things where you're going to say it one time and it's going to stick you know you've got to keep repeating it over and over and over and over again because it's got to then become part of part of your program and it's got to be to be to become part of your program has to become part of them has become part of how they think how they respond and you know you're basically going over going 18 going over 18 years of being programmed one way and now I'm trying to reprogram to think how we believe basketball should be played and how we should be, how we should treat one another. So, um, so if you're starting out, you know, make sure that you do a deep dive in yourself, what's most important to you. So you can be genuine to the people that you're leading. I love the values part. I think it's, I think that's great. How, how do you, how do you personally define success and has that changed for you over time? Like, did you define it one way five years ago, 10 years ago, and now you define it differently today? Or do you think that's been a mainstay for you? I would say a mainstay for me and how I define it within, within coaching was, are we getting the most out of this group that we have? You know, sometimes you have a 25 win group and sometimes you have a 10 win group. You know, if I get that 10 win group to 12, you know, then we've, we've done our job. We've done everything we're supposed to do. If that 25 win group wins 16, then I haven't done my job. And, you know, if I'm using that result number, you know, and again, I'm saying that's why my whole thing is like, 
getting the most out of everyone that you have, you know, being at your best when your best is required, you know, have you been able to do that for your group consistently? Um, you know, it's really easy to give like a number for a metric, but so many of the things that we're teaching and doing, you know, they're like invisible skills and they're invisible responses that will eventually lead into something that people can see. So trying to be consistent with, um, with that level of success and defining it as such, I do think it's important for me. Um, the challenge for me is always getting our players to define as success because they want to win every yeah. game like I do. Right. So yeah. if we go oh for one, they're going to say, coach, we're oh for one. Like, you know, it's like, no, like we believe in something much bigger than ourselves and we're able to do that. Um, you know, we're just going to be a really challenging team to beat. Yeah. That, that, that getting the most out of your group. I'll, I'll never forget like the one year we won five games in high school. My dad came up to me after the game and he said, that might be the best year you've ever had. And yeah. it's like, you know, that he was probably right. Cause they shouldn't have won two or three games. And, and I think the other thing I always liked was, you know, are you better at the end of the year and we're at the beginning of the year, you know, yeah. did you make some progress throughout the course of the season? I, I, I do have one other one, but I I'm thinking of something right now too, that I know I, I, I read or I heard from you on another podcast and this goes into the, the, uh, the, the education part of it too. Talk to me a little bit about this meditation. I think that's one of the first yeah. people you brought in there. Um, yeah. I, I know you had a, uh, you kind of had a, a dive of psychology of hoops, even I think it was Brian Levinson when I, when I yeah. talked to him or had, you know, I, I want to just hear about that a little bit from you and why that's so important. Yeah. We're bringing in a lot of different guys, um, a lot of different people that I think can make our players lives better. I do think that's really important. Like there's certain expertise that I just don't have. Right. And so you're looking at how much in, how much anxiety and anxiousness is out there for all people right now, especially coming out of the pandemic, getting adjusted to, to how the new normal is operating now. So, you know, for me, I've always made that a major priority. Um, you know, my father had me meditating when I was a young kid. So obviously meditation is something that's easy for me to reach, but a little bit more difficult for others. But just the research of what the power of meditation is and the power of yoga, you know, those different things matter in terms of just showing our players Hey, we're going to go do some things that we believe are going to make your life better. And if two guys in that locker room love doing it, if eight guys in the locker room love doing it, then we're in a great place. And we're going to bring in different people to kind of connect them with that. And, you know, just the ability, I mean, so much of us right now, you know, especially if I remember as a young athlete, you're just going from one thing to the next and you're not having time to process who you're becoming and, and where you're going, you know, you just know you want to get to the next game. And yeah, that's good. You know, I wanted to, I want our guys to get to that next game and be ready to go and have detox all the things they need to detox so they can go and attack it and be the best version they can be. That's great. Yeah. And I, I, I gotta imagine they're just evolving then as people, right. I, th I think that's a big part of the process and what you're talking to. Hey, be before we get here to the, the three pointers, um, Tell me how you grow, Coach. You, you're a reader. We like talking about books on here, podcasts. What 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 are different ways that you're growing and pouring into yourself? Yeah, you know, I'm really intentional with my time. And I think that's something that I think is really important for people to do. You know, you talk about the first thing you do when you're growing. You know, I I I I made a list out about five years ago, and it's the 10 things that I'm doing when I'm at my best. And my thing is like I think everyone should write their own list out. Um, and just be really intentional. Like when I'm doing my very best, what 10 things I'm doing, you know, and, uh, and I think that's important, you know, and some of those things might be, Hey, I'm going to a movie once a week or whatever it can be. But I think being intentional, what, what, what allows you to be at your best. And I don't necessarily think that we all, all, I know I haven't always been intentional with that. And I've tried to be much more intentional with that over the last five years. And that's really helped me, um, you know, within my list is definitely podcast and listening in some learning environment, you know, one of the rules I had when I, when I traveled about 30 minutes to work is I didn't listen to any music in the car. I was like, I'm only going to listen to podcasts or books on tape. Right. And so, you know, there's these little rules that you can give yourself that just don't allow you to waste any time and allow you to stay in this learning environment. I operate best when I'm giving myself a learning environment, when I'm constantly in this flow of learning and listening to new ideas. And I don't have to apply all the ideas, but I want to be in this world where I'm constantly learning from other people and what they're doing. You know, so those things really help me. I think also knowing the people in your life that give you energy and give you clarity um, and giving those guys mind space and, and giving those people mind space, uh, but also recognize the people that take energy away from you and, yeah, and right. understanding like, you know, like a lot of times we have someone that's taking energy away from us, but we've been friends with them for so long that we can see to connect with them. And, you know, it might, doesn't mean you don't have to connect with them, but it might mean it should be a five minute conversation, not a 30 minute conversation because the energy that's taken from you. And, you know, I'm just a big believer in being intentional with your time, intentional with what you're putting into your body, both what you eat, what you drink, but also what you listen to, yeah. um, you know, working your mind, I think is a really important part of it. And, and that allows you to be at your best. 
Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. That's really good. And it's almost like you mentioned rules. I'd also even tell people boundaries. You know, you gotta have those boundaries yeah. in your life, right? I mean, that's really important. Do you do you have a favorite book of all time or a best book that you read recently? Ooh, you know, I love Sacred Hoops by Phil Jackson. Uh-huh. Uh, I've read that a ton. Um, you know, but I kind of go back and forth. I mean, I read a bunch of really good ones. Um, because I think that's like, I think that's something that you're able to really grow from. I love Phil. I love the Phil Jackson book, Sacred Hoops, because I feel like it's like, it's one of his earlier dives into like a basketball psychology and in basketball, like how they operate and explaining, you know, what I love about Phil Jackson is he's genuinely who he is. And he was able to have his team appreciate that and see that. And I think that's the real journey as a leader and as a head coach is like, can you take your personality and what you believe in? And, and able to have your team follow that. Because if you do, that's your most genuine self. Yep. And that's the way that you're going to be able to lead the best. And I felt like he was able to do that. Um, you know, so I, I, I love that book. Um, I think that's an excellent one. If, and, and it's, a, it's funny, I've, I've, li- I've read more business books as a, over the last three or four years, but I always sort of come back to, to Sacred Hoops as like a, a foundational book for me. Good. Good. Yeah. That's a good one. Well, Hey, we'll, we'll go rapid fire to finish. If you got to take a little longer, go ahead. Three pointers. Or maybe I should just be like three full court traps or something. It might be better <laughs> conducive to number, number one, if people, if, if people could learn one thing from this talk coach and you just want one thing for them to grab hold on to, what would you want that to be? Uh, love who you are and push through life, finding more about yourself. Good. Number two, if, if you could have come over here today and been me, and ask Coach Christian a question. What question would have you asked them that I did not ask? Speaking of accountability here. <laughs> mm. What factors in your life allow you to, to be climbing the ladder the way you are? Good, good. Care to give one? Uh, my wife and my son, Jacoy, um, the support network I've been able to put around myself for the last few years. Love it. Finally, good stuff is the name of this. What's What's some good stuff that you feel – is appropriate right now or you can give us in closing um just love yourself i mean i'm all about this love yourself um right now i feel like so many people are are coming back into the world and they're comparing everything that that's going on around them and i think love yourself you know be honest with yourself about what's most important don't allow the media or people around you to tell you what you how you should think and what you and what you should be um recognize that everybody's on the on their own race and you're on your own race and appreciate that and appreciate the stops along the way on the race. All right, coach, you got all three traps successfully, man. You got, you got <laughs> three turnovers. You got some layups and dunks there. Hey, finally, just kind of tell our listeners where they can connect with you personally, uh, social media or anything, uh, GW hoops. Yeah, they can find me just Jamie and Christian on Twitter and uh, coach Jamie and Christian on, on IG. You can find me all there and I'm pretty active on both, both of those. And, and uh, you know, love interacting with, with, uh, with people that support us. Well, Coach, man, I appreciate your time. Like I said earlier, I know it's a crazy time, man. And and, and just uh, just the, the fact that you were able to make this work and being intentional with that time block and us going back and forth, it means a lot to me. Uh, you know, as a former coach, I, I truly value uh, not only, you know, who you are in terms of that job, but what you do and how you do it, especially your philosophy. I, th- those kids are so lucky and your staff so lucky to be around you every day. So, uh, best of luck this season and keep making a difference coach. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. And, I, and I'm lucky to be around these guys too. I mean, it's a, we do it as a team. We do it as a unit and, and I appreciate you having me on here today. Yeah, you got it. Well, Hey everybody, there is tons in here today. As always reach out to me at good stuff, Kevin at gmail.com. Let me know what you think of uh, coach Christian. If you're going to be following them this year, get some wins and hopefully watch them in the NCAA tournament. As always, we do appreciate you listening until next time. Good stuff.